Let's get started with what we're seeing right now because it seems the vaccines are making their way across the United States. Alaska coming out and saying they're going to start vaccinating everyone. Let me just ask you at this point in time, when we're seeing more and more supply out there, should the requirements be lowered right now? They're being low, they've been lowered very gradually so far, and there are so many people out there that could be getting vaccinated right now. Well, the issue is not the will to do it. The issue is the supply. And as fast as we can manufacture these vaccines in a safe way uh, and get them out there, we're getting them out there. So we're way ahead of where we thought we'd be, about 3 million people a day in the United States, and it's rising. So those problems are getting addressed. And as they get addressed, more and more people will become eligible. Very shortly, where I live in Manhattan in the Northeast, uh, most people uh, who are 60 or older will be getting the vaccines and very soon it will be 50 and over. So uh, we're doing pretty well and we hope to do better still. You know what has been scary for me lately that perhaps we will see some people who are vaccinated and others who haven't had the chance and those people will mix together. What are some of the things that they should keep in mind? They should keep in mind that uh, people who are vaccinated aren't necessarily protected from infection and transmission. We hope that they are, but we don't know that yet. And that's one of the things we're really waiting to see. So people who are vaccinated could be unwitting carriers of the disease. We know that's true with flu, and we know it can be true with the inactivated polio vaccine. So we know this can happen. We're hoping it doesn't happen, but it might. And if that's true, vaccinated people could be infecting unvaccinated people. On the other hand, if there are some very strong variants, some of which are circulating in the United States, the unvaccinated people could infect the vaccinated people, and there may be some unfortunate consequences of that. So at this point, it's prudent to stay masked and to stay safe, maintaining your social distance, unless you're with family members who really know that you've all been vaccinated. So I'm guessing that it concerns you that at a time when we're still seeing some pretty high infection numbers across the US, you have states abandoning their mask mandate, you have Disneyland partially reopening. Is this the wrong kind of sense of false confidence that we're seeing right now? It's the wrong time to do it. If this were two months from now, maybe it's the right time. But right now we have 50 to 60,000 people uh, being infected every day. We had 12,000 people die last week of COVID. This is not a time to relax. This is a time to hold tight and to wait until the numbers drop very low. And it's possible that they will, but not if we relax, not if we go on spring break, not if we drive up the infection rates again. And I have to say, something that's been sort of disappointing is to see the change in the slope of decrease from very steep to very shallow, and in some cases, rising a bit. So this is not a time to relax, not at all. I saw a number yesterday that is really quite concerning. One in five Americans saying that they won't get the vaccine or they don't want to get the vaccine. We know that vaccine hesitancy as well as, uh, you know, vaccine arbitrage are, are different kind of nuanced issues that a lot of governments are dealing with. What happens if one in five Americans don't get vaccinated? Do we get to a level of immunity that's still effective? Uh, that depends on children. Uh, how effective it is to vaccinate children. I don't think that one in five includes children. We need to have a lot of the children infected too. Some of these variants seem to prefer children uh, and that's uh, a dangerous situation. And so once we can get our children vaccinated and if 75% of the rest of the population agrees that they should be vaccinated, then I think we're gonna be in a pretty good place. Um, we do have to beware and try to get second and third generation vaccines to protect against all variants. And I think that's going to be possible. Yeah, uh, that's what I was going to ask. Like your book says variants, a shape-shifting challenge of COVID-19 vaccines. Where do we go from here? How long will it take for those next generation vaccines to really reach the supply, to reach everyone? Will there be enough time given that it's taken us this long to get to the first shots? Well, First of all, it's taken us a record time to get the first shot. But what mm -hmm. I would hope is that we put the same effort behind these second and third generation vaccines that may have the power to be not only protect you 
more thoroughly against the original virus, but from a broad spectrum of viruses. And there's some new scientific advances that make that seem likely possible. So there's some very good news on that front, but we've got to put our weight behind it just as we did behind the initial generation of vaccines to make sure those get developed as fast as possible. And once developed, get distributed as fast as possible because we don't want this to be like the flu that comes back every year and kills a lot of people. We just don't want that. And maybe it's possible if we're smart and we work hard and fast, we'll be able to avoid that.